everybody. Welcome to Sabbath School. Happy to be here this morning. It's a little wet outside, but uh, we pray for the Son of Righteousness to be in our hearts. I want to start with prayer, and then we'll move right into the lesson study this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you today uh, for the Sabbath day, a time we can come away from all of our stress and worries and the busyness of life and focus on you. We want to pause and ask for the Holy Spirit to be with us as we study your word, come into our hearts and our minds, direct us so that we can gain a deeper understanding of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our lesson for this week is continuing in the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, if there's anyone here that's visiting that's not been here before, we want you to know if you want to make a comment, there's a mic in the back. It's right, if you can see it right there, and be, there is an online audience, so for them to hear your comments, which we want them to, then you don't have to move unless you want to, but, but that's where you make a comment uh, to participate. Sabbath school should be a participatory exercise, not so much a lecture, so feel free to make comments, answer questions, and make this more interactive. So today we're continuing in our study of Deuteronomy, and we're looking at Deuteronomy in the New Testament, how the New Testament authors quoted the book of Deuteronomy. And to get started, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 is where we're going to start this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And um, would someone like to step to the mic and read that for us? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Anyone who has it, just jump right up there. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All right, 2 Timothy 3, 16. Mm -hmm. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All right, so Paul here is, say, is saying all Scripture. Does anybody know when this was written, this particular text? Actually, it would be the book of 2 Timothy. Does anybody know what year that was written, roughly? AD Around A.D. 64, 65, right in that area, yep. And, you know, the, the New Testament was, became the New Testament over time, but the earliest date when they started to put together those letters that the apostles were writing to the churches, the first date when they, when they feel comfortable, probably this is when it started coming together to be canonized. Does anybody know that date? I'll help you out. It was around 80 to 100 A.D. So around 80 to 100 A.D., the New Testament starts to be formed but this was written in about 60 A.D. So when Paul says all Scripture, what was the only Scripture available at that time? It was the Old Testament. There was no other Scripture. So when he says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, what is doctrine? Truth of God or teachings from Scripture. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, we all love reproof, don't we? <laughs> We're going to see that in our lesson. We're going to see how Jesus used Scripture for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So that includes the Old Testament. So as we're reading through the book of Deuteronomy, we're realizing it, and we're seeing that the Old Testament is just as powerful today as it was when Moses wrote it. The book of Deuteronomy is an interesting book. Did you know, according to the Bible commentary on page 954, that every true Hebrew recited one chapter of Deuteronomy every day? So it's no surprise this is why Jesus quoted from it. This is probably one of the books that they knew the best because of how they, had to recite, how they would recite it. The true, it says the true uh, Hebrews would do that. So obviously not everybody, but the true, true Hebrews. Also... The book of Deuteronomy, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse 8. And we want someone to step up and read that. And we're turning to that. The next verse we're going to read after 2 Kings 22 and verse 8 is Deuteronomy 31 26. So if one person would come up for 2 Kings 22 8. 
And then we'll have someone else ready to read Deuteronomy 31, 26. So 2 Kings 22 and verse 8. <clears throat> Second Kings 22, 8. Then uh, Hekiah, the high priest, said to uh, Shaf- Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hekiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Very good. Thank you. So you remember this story. This is, this is when the, a great reformation begins in Israel. They find this book that, had been, that they had lost, and it's referred to as the book of the law. Well, what book is that specifically talking about? Well, if we read, go ahead and read Deuteronomy 31, 26. To put this book of the law beside the ark as a solemn warning to the people of Israel. So this book of the law specifically, more specifically, it was the book of Deuteronomy. It was a book of Deuteronomy that caused this reformation. Have you ever thought of the book of Deuteronomy as causing a reformation? Let me read to you from uh, Prophets and Kings. <clears throat> now, this is taken from, uh, I, have, I have the Apple books, and I use the Apple books because it's easy to copy and paste when I want to put a quote in my notes. So the, page, the pages are different. You, know, you can zoom out of it or zoom in, and it ch- all the pages change. So, uh, but this is on the chapter when Josiah has this reformation. This is what Mrs. White says. Josiah was deeply stirred as he heard, read, for the first time, the exhortations and warnings recorded in the ancient manuscript. Never before had he realized so fully the plainness with which God had set before Israel life and death. You know, you read that in Deuteronomy. Blessing and curses. Then she quotes Deuteronomy 30, 19. And how repeatedly they had been urged to choose the way of life that they might become a praise to the earth, a blessing to all nations. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid. Israel had been exhorted through Moses, for the Lord thy God, he it is that, hath, that doth go before you, and he will not fail you, nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 31.6. So this book of the law that Josiah finds is Deuteronomy. And it is this Deuteronomy that causes this reformation. And I don't know if you've been reading through Deuteronomy or not, but Deuteronomy really has, has four sections in it. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. They are the last four sermons of Moses before he passes. There's, there's some legislative things in between, and there's some other, but there's four sermons, his last four parting sermons, almost like the four Gospels, are in the book of Deuteronomy to encourage his people as they go into the promised land. Uh, Very encouraging history, warning, legislation, like we said, law. And you'll find in there, if you're looking in Deuteronomy, you will find the new covenant, specifically in chapter 4, but it's scattered throughout, but really in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy, it is no wonder that Jesus, in the wilderness, quoted Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is is, is a lot more powerful book, as I've studied this quarter, than I ever realized. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, you know, I always looked at it as a, the, one of those books of Moses that's full of all these ceremonies and all that, but it's not. It's, it's, it's much deeper than that. It's much more full than that. So let's go to Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. Someone who hasn't read yet, if you'll step up to the mic, Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15. Thank you, Dr. Phil. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15. The, new, the time will come when the Lord your God will send you a prophet who's somewhat like me and yet totally different. He will grow up among you and be one of you. He's the one you will need to listen to. All right. The Lord your God will raise up a prophet like unto me. All right. Now, we know if you studied the lesson, Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 7, both Peter and Stephen quote the verse as, apl- as applying to the Messiah, right? How was Jesus a prophet like unto Moses? How was Jesus a prophet like unto Moses? That's a question for you. Uh, how was Jesus a prophet 
like Moses. Well, he uh, interceded for the people. Time and again, we saw Moses. You know, God was displeased with the people, and, and he would test Moses, I think, and say, you know, I'm going to destroy this people. And Moses would throw himself down and say, Lord, for your goodness, please don't destroy this people. He was pleading for the people. Mm -hmm. And this was a type of what Jesus would do in his ministry to minister for the people and plead for their lives and make atonement for their sin. All right, so one of the ways that he was like Moses just like Moses over and over and over again. In fact, one place Moses says, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna do this, wipe my name out of the book, right? Just take me out of the book. So one way is that Moses was a mediator and Jesus was, is currently our mediator, right? Any other ways, any other ideas, any other ways that Moses was like, or Jesus was like unto Moses? Moses climbed a mountain. Mm, very good. Jesus had to climb many mountains, didn't he? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I would say that in, Jesus came in the form of, of a man. He, uh -huh. he, he, didn't, he did not come in a supernatural way. He was just born in flesh <laughs> like we are, like Moses was, mm. while he was here on earth. So he was, he was another man. He was not, there was no physical or anything uh, outstanding of him. He was like a, a common Jewish of that time. So he was one like Moses. So if you're, while you're right there, will you look up Hebrews 2, 14? Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. And then we're going to read verse 14. Then we're going to jump down and read verse 16. This goes right along with what you're saying, that another way that Moses was like us is, or that Jesus was like Moses is in his flesh. Do you, if you have that, go ahead and read it. All right, let me just one second. Hebrew chapter 2 and verse 14, and then we'll read verse 16. <coughs> 14, right? Yes. Okay, is it for as much? Then, as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And then verse 16. And 16. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. All right, so he was like us in flesh. He didn't come as an angel, right? He didn't come with all of the power and the authority that angels have. He didn't come with all of the strength and of the angels. He came with the weakness of Moses, right? Which is the weakness of me and you, you and I. He came in, in like flesh, just like us. And then we read in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18. Someone step up to the mic, please, and read Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18. And then we want uh, someone else to read Hebrews 4 and verse 15. So Hebrews 2, verse 18, and then Hebrews 4 and verse 15. By the way, while we're talking about Hebrews, next quarter the lesson is on Hebrews. So we get a little taste of that right now. Go ahead, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18. And overcome, he is able to help others overcome and to give victory to those who are tempted. Amen. All right, and then chapter 4 and verse 15. Thank you. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So one of the reasons why Jesus became like unto Moses was so that he could understand us right where we're at, become a faithful high priest, and know exactly how to diagnose us, <laughs> right? And not only diagnose, but heal. Because when we go, you know, it's, when I was teaching, in, I, I had a little time where I went and taught in a public school. And we, the vice principal that was over me 
was a vice principal who had been in education, but she had been a counselor. She had never been in the classroom. And so as, as she would come in and try to counsel me, I never appreciated what she had to say to me. Because in the back of my mind, I would always say, you've never been in the classroom. You've not been where I'm at. How could you possibly know what I'm going through, right? But with Jesus, that's not the case. He can, when, when you have a loved one that passes away, Jesus says, oh, no, I know what that feels like. I lost my father. I know what it feels like. I lost Lazarus. I know what that feels like when you get sick. I know how that feels when you're tired. I know what that feels like. So we don't have a high priest that's up in heaven standing before God himself that is not touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And so no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're feeling in that moment, you know that you have a high priest that completely understands and has had that feeling of complete loneliness, of complete despair. I mean, think about Jesus on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He really felt that, right? That's what he was feeling. Have you ever felt that? And so you have a high priest who was made like Moses, who, was, who, who in all points, just as we are, has been tempted and yet is able to now secure us or to help us in our times of temptation. And so that leads us to the question, well, how was he tempted in all points as we are? So let's go to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. If someone will come up and read that. 1 John 2 verse 16, kind of, you know, all sins are under the category of selfishness. But then under that category of selfishness, there's, su- there's, there's three subtitles that all sins fit into. And your sin is, is in one of these three areas or maybe a combination of these three. So go ahead and read 1 John 2, verse 16. For all these worldly things, these evil desires, the craze for sex, the ambition to buy everything that appeals to you, and the pride that comes from wealth and importance, these are not from God. These are from the evil world itself. Very good. That's an interesting translation. It's a little more to the point. Mine says, maybe yours says this, the lust of the flesh, right? The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. So under the category of selfishness, you've got these three subcategories. And so lust of the flesh, you know, we're talking about appetite, right? We're talking about addictions. We're talking about Food, we're talking about sexuality, we're talking about all these are come under lust of the flesh. And then under the lust of the eyes, we're talking about covetousness, greed, desire for things that usually manifests itself in a desire for money. More, 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 so I can buy more things, the lust of the eyes. And then the pride of life is talking about pride. (laughs) Is pride a problem? Absolutely. We're going to now go to Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to see how Jesus was tempted in all three of these areas, just like we are. And how he wins wins the victory for us. So let's go to Matthew chapter 4. And by the way, as we're turning there, what are some parallels between the children of Israel's journey and Jesus' journey in the wilderness? Anybody can step up to the mic and answer that, process that a little bit. Jesus in the wilderness and the children of Israel in the wilderness. What are some parallels there that we see before we dig too deep into this? Anybody have any ideas on that? How many days? Go ahead. Thank you. Well, first physically. Mm. They were without water. Okay. They were without bread. The Lord supplied those needs. Uh-huh. Uh, you were hinting at the 40 days. Yes. They were 40 years. That's right. So just in the physical sense, those are some parallels that I see. And then right before the children of Israel went into the wilderness, what did they pass through? The Red Sea, Sea, right? And Jesus, right before he went to the wilderness, was baptized. Paul makes that analogy Mm -hmm. And, and passed through. So there are these... 
um, amazing analogies and parallels that we see with Jesus in the wilderness because Jesus is going to overcome where they f- failed, right? This is, gonna, this is a pivotal thing that we'll come to at the end of the lesson, but Jesus is going to overcome where we fail. And we see this through this story as we go. So Matthew chapter 4, <clears throat> if someone would come up and read verses 1 to 4 for us. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus and the wilderness being tempted, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man <coughs> shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. All right, so 40 days and 40 nights with no food. It says here clearly that Jesus is hungry. There is no, at this point, there is no supernatural sustaining power other than Jesus obeying God's word. Now, we can talk about he's doing it through the Holy Spirit. He's doing it through the power of God, yes. But there's, there's nothing supernatural here that Jesus has done that you and I cannot do. Right? He's not using a power that we do not have access to. And so he does this incredible thing. He, he, we've, we've seen other people, you know, Gandhi did quite a fast as well. So it's, the fasting is not so extraordinary, although I don't know that I could go 40 days without eating, I can tell you that. There's no way. But um, what is the temptation of the three that's involved here? Go ahead. I was just wanting to say something about that. When Peter let go of Jesus' hand when he was walking on water, Mm. it was because they weren't ready yet. Mm. Jesus was trying to lead them back to God, Mm -hmm. back to the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. When he fed the thousands, the fish, Jesus never ate the fish. He knew then that they weren't ready. But now he's calling us together. Mm. Because once we come together, he understands that we can't do it without him. That's true. That's without his power and his might. So what is, the, what is that ten? We, we listed the three, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Which, which of those three is Jesus overcoming here? <coughs> lust of the flesh, right? This is, he is overcoming here an appetite. By the way, we'll link this, but know that in Genesis chapter 3, when Eve is tempted... It's the same scenario. She saw that the tree was, so her eyes saw that it was something to be desired of, to make one wise, so the pride of life. And you you get the same things in there if you unpack Genesis chapter 3. So here Jesus is meeting this temptation of addiction, sexual sins, gluttony, all this, the sins of appetite. This is what he's meeting head on. Mrs. White says this in Desire of Ages under the chapter called The Temptation. The page that I have is 114, but again, I'm using Apple Books, and the pages are off if you look it up. For our sake, he exercised a self-control stronger than the hunger, than hunger or death. And in this first victory were involved other issues that enter into all our conflicts with the power of darkness. What do you think in this first temptation might be one of those other issues that enters in our, with our struggles and our, our battles with the powers of darkness. And, you know, we're, we've looked at appetite. We've seen that he was hungry. He denied his hunger. He wouldn't fall to that temptation like Adam and Eve, like we do so often. But what is the other? She's alluding to something, something other that might be there. Okay, Proverbs 3.18 Wisdom is a tree of life. To those who eat her fruit, happy is the man who keeps on eating it. If you understand that, that means that God is trying to feed us wisdom. And when, we, when it says to eat fruit, it's not the literal, literal fruit. It's the truth of God. So, you know, Jesus is waiting on God because God, the Spirit, we, we read the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit led him to the wilderness And so he's going to wait for God to lead him out, right? But there's something else in there that Satan insinuates, right? It was, if you be the Son of God, right? You catch that? 
Now, before this, what had happened? Jesus had been baptized, and when he was baptized, a dove came down, and there was this great confirmation that he was the Son of God. Go ahead. I think in that moment, <coughs> Satan was telling Jesus, if you're a son of God, you can do everything. Yeah. You can turn this, this stone into bread. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I, I don't believe that is, that is a temptation that Satan is come to me. Because yeah. he, he probably said, no, nah, Juan is not going to do that. Mm -hmm. But Jesus has the power to do that. He, actually, he did miracles just mm -hmm. like that yeah. before. But not to presume that he was something or he was God. And he was, so it was a very clever temptation from the devil. Very, very clever temptation. And, and, and you know, he's insinuating, you know, hey, there was something that happened in heaven. There was uh, somebody cast out of heaven and, and all these things happened. I'm not really sure who you are. But if you are the son of God, if that's who you are, you should be able to turn this stone into bread and take care of your hunger. So there's an insinuation of doubt, right? And then the insinuation for Jesus to have to prove himself. Now listen to this from the Spirit of Prophecy. In the tones of his voice, Satan, in the tones of his voice is an expression of utter incredulity. Would God treat his own son thus? Now, it's interesting because Satan does the same thing to Eve, right? Did God really say Oh, by the way, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, you will be like gods. And so it's kind of the same idea. Satan is just insinuating this doubt and insinuating these other ideas like the character of God is being attacked. Would God leave you in the desert with wild beasts, without food, without companions, without comfort? He insinuates that God never meant his son to be in such a state as this. And yet it was the spirit that led him into the wilderness. Right? If thou be the Son of God, show thy power by relieving thyself of this pressing hunger. Command that the stone be turned to bread. That's from Desire of Ages. And she goes on. Not without a struggle could Jesus listen in silence to the arch deceiver. You know, it wasn't like Jesus, this was a cakewalk for Jesus. Right? There was a struggle going on in his heart in this moment. Do we ever have struggles in our hearts in those moments of temptation? There is a struggle going on. But the Son of God was not to prove his divinity to Satan or to explain the reason for his humiliation. Going on, this is actually in the next chapter. Christ was tempted to answer the if, but he refrained from the slightest acceptance of the doubt. He would not imperil his life in order to give evidence to Satan. And so we see Jesus being tempted here in all points, like as we are made like unto Moses, made in our flesh, dealing with these temptations like we are. So what was Jesus' rebuke, or I should say, where did the rebuke come from that Jesus gave Satan in this moment? Say again. Deuteronomy, especially, uh, let's go there. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. <clears throat> Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy. By the way, if Deuteronomy is good enough for Jesus, <laughs> it's probably pretty good for me. Right? Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. If someone would step up and read this for us. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. We can see exactly where Jesus is quoting from to rebuke Satan in this time of temptation. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. Thank you. He humbled you by letting you get hungry. Then he fed you with manna, which no one had ever heard of, to teach you that man is not sustained by bread alone, but by feeding on the word that comes from God. You know, I just love this. Uh, other versions say, it is, Jesus said, it is written. <laughs> and, um, but w when Jesus quotes this, he's quoting back to the experience the children of Israel had when they were hungry. Right? And he's applying that experience they had to his experience, only unlike them. Remember, in the wilderness, they complained and murmured. He's not complaining and murmuring. He's relying on the word only to do only what the word says. Go ahead. In both Matthew and in Deuteronomy, it 
points you to the word of mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. And it makes me realize that we cannot be prepared enough. We can't be yes. prepared enough. We have to read daily. We have to read multiple times a day. We yes. have to feed ourselves because if a siege is coming and there's no food <coughs> there, we have to be prepared to sustain ourselves. We cannot pick up our Bible the day the trial begins. That's right. And start strengthening ourselves. We have to do it daily. A absolutely. And we're prone to forget or misapply or reinterpret, which is what's happening right now, right? So right now, there's, there's so many things that are trying to be reinterpreted in Scripture. One of them is marriage, and that marriage can be between man and man and, or woman and woman. And even though the Scripture clearly says, you can read Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Romans chapter 1, clearly says that that's an abomination. There are those, even among us, who are struggling with that. And it's because of this, because we're not daily in the Word like we need to be. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. That's the, that's, the, that's the heart of it. And we need to be in the Word and be reminded of these spiritual things. And we need to be filled with the Spirit to give us the perception to see these things. All right, next temptation. <clears throat> I am praying we get through this. There's a lot to cover here. Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 4. Let's go back there. We're going to read uh, verses 5 to 7. Someone come up and read Matthew 4, verses 5 to 7. Second temptation. And as we go through these temptations, don't worry, we will, we will tap into those other days of the week as we go. Don't worry. Thank you. Starting with verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up. Least at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. All right, so here, you know, it's almost like Satan said to Jesus, You want to quote scripture? Okay. I'll quote some scripture, right? What did Satan leave out in his quote? What did he leave out? He's quoting, I believe this is quoting from Psalm 91. He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Well, the first part, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, meaning God's ways. Satan left that little piece out, right? Right? He's so good at taking scripture and just kind of changing it by about two degrees, right? Just enough to get you going off this way. And that's what he's doing here. He's quoting scripture, but he's quoting it in a way that, that gives a different meaning than the text ever meant to have. So what is the temptation here? What's the temptation that's coming at Jesus? Any ideas? What would you, if there, is there one word you could use to sum up this temptation? Presumption, right? Presuming that if I <clears throat> put myself in this dangerous situation, God is somehow going to override all of my choices and keep me from hurting myself as I jump off this building, right? Presuming on God. What's the difference between presumption and faith? What's the difference between presumption and faith? Any ideas? Well, you know, we can see this played out in our lives. Faith is knowing God has given me a life. He's given me his word to live that life by and walking day by day with him and having faith that whatever happens will be in his will because mm. I'm walking with him. Okay. And so there'll be hard times and there'll be good times and we'll go through valleys <laughs> and we'll go over the mountain too, but we're in his will. And so I know that whatever happens, it's okay. Mm -hmm. it will, it's in his will. Mm -hmm. Presumption would be, I want to do this. Mm. You know, I want to drive 100 miles an hour on a dangerous road, and the Lord should protect me. Yeah. Why is that? Because I want to do it. Even though the speed limit says 35 curve coming Dangerous up. curve, 35. <laughs> right. But I want to go 100. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in life we see many people who want to do something. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing that? Because I want to do it. Yes. How's that going to turn out? God's going to protect me. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. presumption. Yeah, so faith leads to obedience. Presumption leads to disobedience. Go ahead. Yeah, I saw, I saw in the news <laughs> recently uh, one athlete, uh, he, he's, he does not want to take the vaccine. He's been pressured and everything. I mean, it, it's up to him. But he made a mistake. He said, my Lord will protect me. Mm. So I think the, the media erupted. He said, well, so God is not going to protect you. Why do you use the seatbelt in your car? Why, mm. why don't you go, uh, like Brent said, 125 miles per hour on the highway? Yeah. So that is a little bit presumption. I think that was the mistake that he made. That, I mean, say, like, God will, go, will protect me from mm -hmm. this virus. I don't yes. have to take that uh, vaccine. And uh, <laughs> That's right. That's right. Go ahead. Well, Psalms 91, which you mentioned earlier, uh, verse 7, Though a thousand fall at my side, though ten thousand are dying around me, the evil will not touch me. I will see how the wicked are punished, but I will not share it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Phil, go ahead. For, forgive me, it's a little child in me. As I, where, <clears throat> where were we reading? Was it five? <laughs> it says, but the devil didn't give up. Next, he picked Jesus up and carried him to Jerusalem to the highest point. Why did Jesus voluntarily let Satan pick him up and take him to the highest point? Forgive me, but I, well, as, I, as I see that, I, I think, you know, uh, why get in the Ferrari with the, the motor running if you know the <laughs> temptation is going to be there? Well, remember at the start of the chapter, uh, if we go back, verse 1 of chapter 4, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So he's not doing this on his own choice, but he's allowed the Spirit to lead him there. Now, I imagine Jesus was so weak from fasting, Satan just picked him up and took him up to that pinnacle quickly. You know, but does that ever happen to us? Does Satan ever take us sometimes to places in our minds that... Uh, you know, and all of a sudden, whoa, what am I doing here on this pinnacle? You know, and you got to catch your mind sometimes. So, so we see again, in my, in my perspective, Jesus is being tempted in all points like as we are. That's what's happening here. And he's allowing himself to experience exactly what we experience in our temptations. But unlike us sometimes, he is being completely victorious because he's relying on the word of God. And the scripture is his strength. So um, presumption, let me read this. This is from Desire of Ages on this chapter called The Victory, page 126 on my Apple book. But faith is in no sense a lie to presumption. Only he who has true faith is secure against presumption, for presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Presumption also claims the promises. Did you catch that? Presumption also claims the promises, but uses them, as Satan did, to excuse transgression. Oh, God is going to forgive me for that. Right? That's presumption. I want to do this thing. Oh, God will forgive me if I do it. Right? That's presumption. And so that leads to disobedience. Now, one other thing. <clears throat> A presumption, or to presume yourself in God's place can also lead to other things, and the, the lesson alluded to this. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Presumption can lead us to presume that we're going to do God's work of vengeance. We're going to presume to be in God's place, right? Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 10, <coughs> verses 28 to 31. Someone come up and read that. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 28 to 31, and this is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 32 in the book of Hebrews, but we get this idea of vengeance. Go ahead and read that for us. A man who refuses to obey the laws given by Moses was killed without mercy if there were two or three witnesses to his sin. Think how much more terrible the punishment will be for those who have trampled underfoot the Son of God, and treated his cleansing blood as though it were common and, hollow, and unhallowed and insulted and outraged the Holy Spirit who brings God mercy to his people. <coughs> uh, go on down to verse 31. 
for we know him who said, Justice belongs to me. I will repay them, who also said, The Lord himself will handle these cases. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, your, your Bible said justice, which is good. Mine says vengeance. <laughs> and so, um, but notice here, as we, thank you, by the way. Notice as we read this, you know, if, if the sacrifices of goats and animals, the things that were a shadow of the things to come, if two or three witnesses saw that you were disobeying that, you were stoned, what's going to happen? This is Paul's point. What do you think is going to happen to the people or the person who disobeys God with two or three witnesses? Jesus, the flesh, the incarnation of everything that was anticipated. What do you think is going to happen to that person who's, who tramples on the grace of God? And, I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing standard that's there. But I wanted to ask this question because we're quoting this from Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. What do you think the difference between revenge or vengeance and justice is? What do you think the difference between vengeance and justice is? Is there a difference? God is a merciful God. <coughs> but the law of Moses is merciless. Well... Um, we may have to discuss that after. I don't think the law of Moses was so merciless. It may seem that way to our culture, to our eyes. But, um, yes. When I was in college, we had to study retributive justice versus restorative justice. Mm. And it should come down to the heart of the offender. So if the offender is sorry, if the offender is repentant, then the justice can be restorative and it can restore the offender and the offended. Mm -hmm. If it's retributive, it's because the heart of the offender was not <coughs> ready to be sorry and therefore the justice had to come by another means. Mm -hmm. So there's an element of trying to bring back balance. I, I, uh, I found these five key differences of revenge and justice I thought were interesting. Reve revenge is predominantly emotional while justice is more rational. Revenge by nature is more personal, while justice is more impersonal, more impartial, and both there's a legal and a social phenomenon involved. Revenge is an act of vindictiveness, right? Justice is an act of vindication. Revenge is about cycles. Justice is about closure. Now, when we say cycles, you can think of the Hatfields and the McCoys, <laughs> right? You got me, now I'm going to get you. When I was growing up, my brother and I, you know, we'd always try to have the last hit. And, and it didn't even matter if I, if I was standing next to him, I just touched him, right? That counted as I got the last hit, right? That's that idea of, of a cycle. And revenge is about retaliation. And this is what I think you were touching on. While justice is about restoring balance. And so we see this difference between vengeance and, 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 and justice. And by the way, when we can say that the Lord has said vengeance is his, I don't have to worry about it anymore, what you've done to me. I'm going to leave it in the hands of God, and it is a fearful thing if you are guilty. <laughs> this is what Paul's saying. If you are guilty and you have not repented, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the mighty God, right? This is why in the last days, what the, 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 those who are unrighteous and see Jesus coming, they're, they're calling for the rocks to fall on them because they, they, they sense that it is, this is a terrible thing that's about to happen. Now, one last thing about presumption, because we want to classify it in those three, one of those three things. Presumption is tied to pride, Presumption and pride go hand in hand. We're not going to, I'm going to read this because we're running out of time, so we're going to go through this real quick to tie this together with pride. Proverbs 13, 10. If you go to Proverbs 13 and verse 10, <coughs> I'm reading from the Amplified Bible because it, it, it shows this idea. Through pride and presumption. Now, your Bible probably just says through pride, but the Hebrew word that's used there, the Hebrew word is zadon, 
And it means arrogance, presumption, and pride. That's what it means. So the Amplified Version has said, through pride and presumption, even though that's one word, come nothing but strife. But, but wisdom is with those who welcome counsel. So there's this connection between presumption and pride. The uh, World Dictionary, Webster's World Dictionary, says this about presumptuous. It means too bold or arrogant, taking too much for granted, showing overconfidence, and normally it's self-confidence, and showing arrogance or effrontery. Synonyms include arrogant, proud, bold, brazen, impertinent, audacious, pompous, pretentious, rash, self-assured, conceited, insolent, egotistic, and self-reliant. So when Jesus overcame this temptation of presumption, he is overcoming the pride of life. One of the manifestations of the pride of life. There's many manifestations, right, of that core sin. But here he is overcoming in all points, tempted just like we are, and he's overcoming this. What was the verse that Jesus used as he defeated Satan here? It was found in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16. And he quotes that same verse, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Messiah. He's using that book of Deuteronomy again. So that was the second temptation, dealing with the pride of life. So Jesus has overcome the lust of the flesh, and he's overcome the pride of life. What does that leave? The lust of the eyes. So here we go. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 to 11. If someone would come up and read this, this is our last temptation of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 to 11. Anybody read that for us? Thank you. Come on up, yeah. <laughs> Matthew 4, 8 to 11. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. All right, so you see, Jesus is up on this pinnacle, and what, what does Satan say to him? Look and see. And he takes him on a journey, and he shows him the most beautiful parts of the world. He doesn't show him the nasty effects of sin. He shows him the glorious structures of man, the pa beautiful palaces, the beautiful gardens, everything that's beautiful, right? And he says, if you will but worship me, all of these things that your eye is seeing, I will give you. Does that sound familiar? You know, I'm reminded of Revelation 13 when I read that this week, right? What happens in Revelation 13? You guys remember? Come on, Adventists have to know Revelation 13. I mean, what happens in Revelation 13? The mark of the beast. And you can only buy and sell if you worship. It's kind of the same thing. I will, I will give you all of these things if you'll bow and worship me. You want access to the economy? You want access to buy and sell? Bow, bow down and worship me. And I will give you access to all these things. Right? And here Jesus is overcoming that same temptation. Right? And again, we see that he's using Deuteronomy chapter 6. Someone come up and read that for us. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13. This is what Jesus is quoting from as he is being tempted, as he is tempted to take hold of, these, of the things of the world, of the lust of the eyes, to have these great things. Thank you, David. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only. 
and take your oaths in his name. Fear the, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him. The idea there is him only. This is what Jesus is again quoting from as he is meeting Satan in this hour of temptation there in the wilderness. So we've seen three times that Jesus was tempted. He was tempted with the lust of the flesh. He was tempted with the pride of life. And he was tempted with the lust of the eyes. And all three of those times, by the word of God, and specifically from the book of Deuteronomy, Jesus overcomes. And again, he uses no power. He uses no ability he uses nothing that is without the realm for you and I to use. What a humiliating act that was for Jesus to do. You know, he was the one who had created all things. He was the one who had been in, in the courts of heaven. He was the one who had given Moses the law. He was the one who had inspired Moses to write the book of Deuteronomy. And when he comes back to this earth, in order to be our example, in order to be likened to Moses, in order so that he could understand us when we're tempted, he takes all of those garments off, humbles himself, and quotes his own inspired word in the battle. Right? I mean, that's an amazing story to, to process that and think that through how that whole thing opened up and how he did that. Let's go now to the book of Galatians. <clears throat> We're in Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to see Paul now quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're going to see the purpose of the victory, if you will, in this verse. So, someone come up and read uh, Galatians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 to 14. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. Yeah, come on up, Melissa. Are you brave enough? <laughs> 3, 1 to 14. Yes. O foolish Galatians, who, have, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel of Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So as we read through this, again we see... Paul is quoting not just from Deuteronomy, which he quotes from Deuteronomy in verses uh, 10 and 13, but maybe you caught also quotes from the book of Genesis, right? He's also quoting from Genesis, quoting from all scripture to make, to make his point and to make his, his uh, uh, picture of Jesus for us. Now, what the lesson focused on in particular was verses 10 and 13, and in verse 10 where it says, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. What does that mean? <laughs> How do you understand that? Reading that verse, 
Paul's using it to help us get a clear picture of Jesus. How do you understand that cursed is everyone that does not continue in all things <coughs> which are written in the book of the law to do them? We cannot f possibly fulfill all the laws without Jesus Christ. Okay, so, you know, it is not possible for us to, f to fulfill every single detail of what Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Exodus, all these books, and the, what they ask us to do, it's without our, beyond our ability, right? And even if, you know, we've kind of alluded to this before, even if this moment, from this moment forward, I could live a perfect life not breaking one of the commandments, I still have a problem. And the problem is the debt I owed before this moment. And that debt is impossible, impossible for me to ever even come close to fulfilling. Even if I did everything right from this moment forward, I could never fulfill the debt of my past. And so I am one, I am the one who should be cursed because I have not done everything that is contained in the books. And then he goes on in verse 13 there, Paul uh, quotes this little phrase, um, verse 13, where he says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What did Jesus hang on? A tree, right? Fulfilling, suffering for the sins that he did not commit, receiving the penalty that was due to me that I might receive the blessing that was due to him. Right? That's the idea that Paul is capturing here. That's the idea that, that he's pulling out of the book of Deuteronomy. He's, he's, he's pulling out of Deuteronomy the gospel. <laughs> he's going back to this old book and he's, and he's using it to say, here's the gospel message and here's, here's where you see it at in full view here in the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus suffered as we deserve so that we can be blessed as he deserves. Right? He took the penalty that was mine that I could take the reward that was his. And I say hallelujah to that, don't you? There is, a, there is a, 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 a chasm that is too wide for me to fill, too broad for me to, to, to bridge, that without Jesus coming down and being victorious in the wilderness and in other places all through his life, without that victory, we would all be lost today. In fact, the human race probably would not even be in existence today. I remember I read a quote once that said that had Jesus not come, the human race would have committed suicide long before now. But because of Jesus' death, and not just what he did legally for me, but because of the principles that he lived out, that, that man began to apply, because of Jesus' life, we have hospitals. Because of Jesus' life, we care about child abuse. Because in Jesus' days, they didn't care about child abuse. I don't know if you know that. If you were a young man and you lived to be the age of 10 and you had not been molested, you were in the minority. That was just the way things were in the Roman world. But because of Jesus' principles, not only did he do something to us uh, legally so that we can be saved, but the principles of his life transformed the world. Universities, another example, uh, the scientific, all, so many things that transformed. There's a book that was written, it was, uh, it's entitled... Uh, what if Jesus had never been born? And, and he just highlights 50 things, and some of them I've mentioned to you, that would have never happened had Jesus never been born. 50, 50 institutions, 50 different things that we do that we care about, only because of Jesus. Go ahead. Genesis chapter 6. Now a population <coughs> explosion took place among the earth. It was at this time that beings from the spirit world looked upon the beautiful earth women and took any they desired to be their wives. Then Jehovah said, My spirit must not forever be disgraced in man. Holy, e holy evil as he is, I will give him 120 years to mend his ways. So the ones that married the women came from the spirit world. Yeah, that's an interesting translation. Not, some of the Bibles don't say it quite like that. Uh, they say the sons of God began to marry the sons of men. And if you read in different places in the New Testament, the sons of God, now are we the sons of God? 
And the sons of God are those who follow God. And uh, now are we the sons of God. And the sons of men were the Canaanites, those who were, go ahead. The context of that scripture is actually the genealogies of Cain and Seth. Yes. And, Cain, and Seth was considered the son of God. Cain was uh, the son of this world. So as you come into that text, you see that they're talking about actually human beings that the sons of God walked after the ways of God as their father Seth did. And the sons of man walked <laughs> after the ways of man as Cain did. That's right. Thank you, Pastor. And so there was this intermarriaging between believers and non-believers. And as that began to happen, uh, things began to dissipate. Well, that's the end of our lesson this Sabbath. I, I uh, just want to encourage us again. The Old Testament is full. The Old Testament is full of the glory of God. And especially the book of Deuteronomy, there is present truth in the book of Deuteronomy, truth that can be applied to today. Uh, I've been reading through chapter by chapter uh, uh, this quarter in the book of Deuteronomy, and I have been amazed at how Scripture has a way of being timeless, right? It has a way of applying even today something that was written four or five thousand, I don't know how many thousands of years ago it was written, but it's still applicable even today. That's how you know it was the Spirit of God that was leading in that. Let's